given a, a number of, of sermons this week, and uh, I haven't given one on prophecy yet. So guess what? <laughs> I think I was just told that I had till 7 o'clock with a break in between for a baptism. <laughs> But in all, in all seriousness, um, uh, this is a very uh, interesting message to me, and I I, uh, I pray that you, that you'll be um, you'll be blessed by it. Can we pray for a moment? Dear Heavenly Father, we we give you praise and honor and glory because you are our God. And we worship you. We give you thanks for this Sabbath day and this time, Lord. And as we worship you with all of creation, Lord, we, we look forward to the blessing that we might receive. Please give us a rich measure of your spirit that we might see Jesus, that we might understand your word. We know that you love us. And we thank you for the blessing we're about to receive. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> I'm, uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit of a, a story how I got to this uh, message. Uh, it's something I've been thinking about for a long time. I've, I've actually shared it with very, very few people. Some of the thoughts that I have. For a long time. Scott, you'll be blessed, I hope. So, <clears throat> sometime back in June, we were sitting on our back deck on Sabbath afternoon, and uh, we were having some discussions. And we got to talking about an event, and good old Zachary was there, and I asked about the event, and when, when by the way, when was that event? And he just, boom, spits out the date. He's really good at that stuff. But when he spit out the date, and I thought how long it's been since that event, that um, I, I couldn't get it out of my mind. So. I, I later on in the week, I started looking some things up, and, and, um, and I, I want to share a few things with you. Turn with me to Revelation chapter 20. Revelation chapter 20. In verse 1 it says, And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold of the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years. And cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal upon him that he should not deceive the nations no more till a thousand years should be fulfilled. And after that he must be loosed a little season. And I saw thrones, and they sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither received his mark in their foreheads or in their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. That's three times it says that. But the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he that has part in the first resurrection. On such the second death has no power. But they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. And when the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison. So in, in seven verses, there's something that God repeats over and over and over again. What is it? I gave it some emphasis. A thousand years. A thousand years. In 2 Peter chapter 3, we are told in verse 8, 2 Peter chapter 3, 
in verse 8. He says, but beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing. So does God want us to know this? A day with the Lord is as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to us word, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in which the heavens shall pass away with great noise and the elements shall melt with fervent heat and the earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. So the context of what he's talking about is the second coming, right? It's the second coming. He's saying, don't be discouraged because the Lord hasn't come. I mean, P- Peter was, he was getting older and uh, it had been some time. And you know, kind of like our pioneers, they were expecting Jesus to come again very, very soon. And so he was basically saying, understand that a day to the Lord is as a thousand years. In Psalms 90, in verse 4, it says, For a thousand years in, the, in thy sight are as but yesterday. As but yesterday. When I, uh, when I left the deck and got on my computer, I was just looking up a few things as it relates to Bible timing, and I found a very interesting chronology index of the years from Adam to Christ. Before I read that, I'd like to read to you a statement from Patriarchs and Prophets, page 342. It says, the great plan of redemption results in fully bringing back the word of God's favor. All that was lost by sin is restored. Now, if you go and you look this up, what you're gonna find out, what she's talking about is the restoration at the end of, 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 of time, okay? After Satan has been bound. She's, talk, she's talking about the restoration. Not only man, but the earth is redeemed to be eternal, the eternal abode of the obedient. Now listen to this. Now she's talking about a specific time frame it, that we read about just earlier. She says, for 6,000 years... But she's talking about a future event. Are you with me? She's talking about when the earth is made new and God's people abode. And she makes this comment. She says, for 6,000 years, Satan has struggled to maintain possession of the earth. Now God's original purpose in its creation is accomplished. You see when the time frame is? The saints of the Most High shall take the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever, even forever and ever. This chronology that I'm going to read comes from a fella by the name of Matthew uh, Carey. And it's, it's very, I, I, I like it for a, a number of reasons. Number one. Um, he uses uh, Usher's Annals of the World, which was published in 1658, around the time, uh, not too far from the King James Version of the Bible. The second thing is, is that he, he did this um, in the year 1801, before Protestantism was called Babylon. Okay? Now, I'm not going to read to you the entire chronology. You know how that goes. Adam begot so-and-so, and so-and-so begot so-and-so, and so-and-so. I'm not going to read all that, but I'm going to give you the, the gist of it. Is that all right? From Adam to Noah was 1,656 years. From the flood of Noah unto Abraham, departing from Chaldea was 422 years and 10 days. 
from Abraham's departing of Ur and Chaldea unto the departing of the children of Israel are 430 years. And from the going of the Israelites from Egypt unto the first building of the temple is 480 years. From the first building of the temple unto the captivity of Babylon is 490, 19 years and a half. Jerusalem was re-edified and built again after the captivity of Babylon, 70 years. The children of Israel were delivered, and we know what that does. That brings us down to the commandment to restore and rebuild Jerusalem. And we wind up with the prophecy of Daniel that leads to the coming of the Lord. Now, this particular fella, um, and I don't, I don't want to read his summary, but he, he uses um, the comments in Luke about the birth of Christ and the taxation of the world. And so he looks at a little bit of history and he makes his determination, as, as well as using Daniel, to come up with the birth of Jesus. Okay? And by coming up with the birth of Jesus, he then does a, a little thing and figures out where, where he is. But we have something even better. We have the spirit of prophecy. And the spirit of prophecy has told us um, the specific time, the specific year that the prophecy was fulfilled in AD 27. Right. Jesus was baptized. Now, according to this fellow, he says... Adam to Christ are 3,974 years, 6 months, and 10 days. So from 1801, I just did a little math, because that's, that's what he's saying. In 1801, it was 3,974 years, 6 months, and 10 days. So... At that time, according to him, the year was 5,775 years from Adam. 5,775 years from Adam. So I just did a little math. 6,000 minus 575 was 225 days. 1801 plus 225 days brings us to 2,026, would make the year 6,000. I've heard a number of these uh, chronological add-ups, right? And sometimes people come up with some very interesting timelines. But I thought this was pretty interesting um, based on, on what I was looking at. But then I thought to myself, huh, Jesus was baptized in AD 27. So 2,000 years from his baptism was 2027. And... <clears throat> I went back and <clears throat> was talking with my wife and uh, was talking to her about this, this uh, timeline. And she says, Walter Weith just did a sermon about this not too long ago from s some of the writings of Sister White. And uh, so she showed me on YouTube uh, where it was and I, I watched it. And he pulls down some more quotations, which I'm going to read from, for you. but. Um, you know, Jesus began his ministry, Ellen White says in four manuscript, she says, Jesus was 30 years old when he entered into public ministry. Now that's significant because Numbers 4 and verse 3 says, from 30 years old and upward, even unto 50 years old, all that enter into the host to do the work of the tabernacle of the congregation. So you can't enter in to do the work of the congregation until you're 30 years old. Guess when Jesus began to do his ministry? He was 30 years old. That's kind of cool, isn't it? Does our God work on a timeline? He does. He does. So here's a couple of the quotations that I'd like to read that uh, Walter found. I, I copied them down, and, and they're very interesting because he talked a little bit about how some of Ellen White's quotations where she talks about 4,000 or 6,000 years are kind of generic. But there are some that are very specific. And I actually just read you one 
at the beginning, right? Where she's talking about the earth being restored and how Satan had tried to get dominion over the earth for exactly 6,000 years. This quotation is from um, Five Bible Commentary. It says, Christ in the wilderness of temptation stood in Adam's place to bear the test he failed to endure. Here Christ overcame in the sinner's behalf 4,000 years after Adam turned his back upon the light of his home. So she's saying it's 4,000 years from the time of the fall when Adam received the promise to where Christ met Satan in the wilderness. Now, where, when Christ met Satan in the wilderness, when was that? A.D. 27. Because he went immediately from his baptism, he was led of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of, 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 of the devil. Review and Herald, August 18, 1874. The Savior of the world had no controversy with Satan who was expelled from heaven because he was no longer worthy of a place there. He who could influence the angels of God against their supreme ruler and against his son, their loved commander, and enlist their sympathy for himself was capable of any deception. 4,000 years he had been warring against the government of God and had lost none of his skill or power to tempt and to deceive. So again, more of a general timeline. But she says in Review and Herald, um, March 18, 1875, that on Jordan's banks, the voice of heaven attended by the manifestation of, from the excellent glory proclaimed Christ to be the son of the eternal. Satan was to personally encounter the head of the kingdom which he had come to overthrow. If he failed, he knew that he was lost Therefore, the power of his temptations was in accordance with the greatness of the object which he would lose or gain. Greatest temptations ever. For 4,000 years, ever since the declaration was made to Adam that the seed of the woman should bruise the serpent's head, he had been planning his manner of attack. Galatians 4, 4 says, When the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his son to redeem them that were under the law that he might receive adoption of sons. So was, was all this done on a specific timing? Not just a prophetic timing, but it's pretty interesting that the prophet makes it very clear that at 4,000 years, Jesus came. Twenty twenty seven is not very far away. You might be thinking, oh, oh Ken is time setting. He, I am. I'm just telling you. Maybe this is approximately when six thousand years is, right? I didn't say that. That's when Jesus is going to come, because the Lord said that He could cut it short in righteousness, so He certainly could come before then, and He could certainly come after them. It's it's the Lord's business. But I've, I don't find it to be much of a coincidence as I see things going on in the world around us. So as I was looking at some of these things online, I, I ran across, across something that was, I, I thought was kind of interesting because of, of a timeline that Zachary gave me. Did you know that there has been an ongoing problem between the the Greek church and the Roman church for almost 2,000 years? Do you know what it's over? It's not the doctrine of the Trinity because they both agreed on that. It's over Easter. It's over Easter. They both use two different calendars. Sometimes almost a full month apart as to when they call Easter, Easter. In 2017, Easter came at the same time for both denominations, something that will not happen again until 2025. 
2025. And it's extremely significant to them. The first ecumenical synod in 325 AD decided that Easter would be celebrated on the first Sunday after the first full moon of spring. If the first full moon occurs on Sunday, then it will be celebrated the next Sunday. Thus, the Christian Easter would never coincide with the Jewish Passover. The papacy, Satan, didn't want any association with the Passover and the resurrection. Because what was Satan doing? He was exalting Sunday. And if he would have brought Passover into it, right, then Easter would have to be a different day. Because whenever Passover falls, three days later, Jesus is resurrected. Wouldn't necessarily fall on a Sunday at all. There's a number of things that occurred when this first ecumenical synod got together. One of them was the doctrine of the Trinity. They both agreed on that. But when it came to Sunday, they, they, they didn't quite agree, and it caused a rift. Do you realize that in 325 AD, when, as a result of this synod, this started persecution of Sabbath keepers? Those who did not accept the doctrine of the Trinity were plucked up by the roots, weren't they? And it didn't matter if you were a Christian because they blamed this association on the Jews. If you kept the seventh-day Sabbath, you must be Jewish. And the papacy hates the Jews, by the way. Laws were made forbidding Jews to keep the Sabbath. So, you know, that's, this is one of the most interesting things about the Sabbath as the mark of the beast, right? Because you can believe whatever you want in your mind, but it's what you do outside that people see that makes the difference in terms of being identified. It's an identifying mark, the Sabbath is. Easter was exalted yearly, then accepted weekly. The Trinity came into existence And as a result of Easter, these two groups broke apart. Reports suggest that Francis and Bartholomew, the head of the Greek church, have talked about staging an ecumenical synod. We just said that, what, that it was an ecumenical synod that put them back to the doctrine of the Trinity, that they would do this together in 2025 because that's when their Easter's come together. To mark the 1700th anniversary of the Council of Nicaea and its famous creed, which both churches share. Do you know what else goes on in 2025? the General Conference session of Seventh-day Adventists in St. Louis, Missouri. The annual council of delegates voted after being told of major improvements in the city of St. Louis to go ahead and have the General Conference there. They hadn't had it there since the date Zachary told me of 2005. And I'll explain to you why that's so significant to me. But first, I need to explain to you a little bit about Pentecost. God, in his wisdom, brought the Israelites out of Egypt on a specific day that he, that he established as the Passover. A few days later, <clears throat> God came down on Mount Sinai and gave them the Ten Commandments, and God established a day for the Jews to keep called Pentecost. 
There are some feasts in the end as well that are extremely significant pertaining to the sanctuary, but I, I want to focus on Pentecost for a moment. If you want to turn with me to Acts chapter 2. Jesus is glorified. And it says, And when the day of Pentecost was come, verse 1, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like unto fire, and it sat upon each of them, and they were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other languages as the Spirit gave them utterance. And there were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews, devout men out of every nation under heaven. Now when this was noised abroad, the multitude came together and were confounded because every man heard them speak in his own language. So God had commanded three times a year that all the males of Jerusalem were to present themselves before him on these feasts. He wanted that as many of the Jews as possible to be there when Jesus was hanging on the cross. And look, that meant they, were, they would have got there in advance in, in preparation for it, right? To make preparations where they were going to have it and how they were going to do the, the Passover. They have a pre preparation point. Well, guess what happened? <clears throat> Jesus came into the, into the city in, in, in triumph. Right? He's on, he's on the ass and the palm branches are going. I mean, it's a big deal. So what do you, what do you think everybody's talking about now? Talking about this guy who came in, Right? The, and all of the, and they're hearing. I mean, these people are from out of town. They're from Greece and Rome and, I, and all of the places that Paul went. And then they see that the, the man who came in in that way hanging on the cross. Now, the next feast they were commanded to be there was... Pentecost. So some of them who traveled a long distance, I guarantee they stayed there the whole time because you couldn't, you couldn't go back and forth to, Gre to Greece or Rome and some of these places that, uh, that are listed. But when the day of Pentecost came and the disciples received the early rain, they came out of that, that room and they were speaking in the languages of all all of the people that were assembled there. What do you suppose those people did after the day of Pentecost? They went back home to their synagogues. For you see, they were all Jews, every single one of them, not one Gentile. The gospel didn't go to the Gentiles for another three and a half years. So when you read in Acts about thousands were converted in a day, and then a short time later, another thousands were converted in a day, they were all Jews. Do you know why they were converted in one day? Because they were all Jews. They only had, they had the sanctuary, they had the truth, they had the commandments. They only had to acknowledge one thing, that Jesus was the Son of Almighty God. What must I do to be baptized? Do you believe with your whole heart that Jesus is the Son of Almighty God? Then yes, you may. But when Paul was converted, and he went from place to place to place, it doesn't say anywhere in the scripture thousands were converted in a day. It says he went into the synagogues and preached, and a lot of times got booted out, and then he met with the Gentiles down by the river, and on and on and on. And it says that he spent a year and a half or something like that in, in, in a place, working with the Gentiles, conv convincing them of the word of God in and, and, and power, Right? But not so on the day of Pentecost, not so as it pertained to the Jews. Because the Gentiles, they needed to learn some things. They needed to learn a few things about 
the Word of God and, and God's dealings because they were, in, they were entering into that covenant relationship, were they not? They were. Now, I, I have to tell you a story, and I, I will try to keep my composure. Remember the date, Zachary said, of 2005? In 2005, <clears throat> Alan Stump and David Clayton were best friends. Howard Williams and I were, and Linford was still living there, and we had uh, <clears throat> we had decided to get a bus. Smyrna bought a bus and it gutted 50% of the seats, maybe even more than 50% of the seats out of the back of that bus. And Ellen had been gathering up literature and we filled the entire back of that bus with literature. And we had a special camp meeting. And some of us were going to go from there to the general conference session. We were going to drive from Smyrna to St. Louis, Missouri. And I'll never forget it. Irwin was there from Germany. Vlad and Andy were there. Sorry. Andy is from Hungary. And Vlad was from Romania. Thanks. Neville was there. He and I became friends. We sat on the bus, both coming back, and we remained friends. We were all in unity of one accord in our mission. My children were there. And we went there, and Swavek was there, running literature back and forth. He ran, it was so hot, and he was running literature back and forth. Salt was building up on the, on the back of his shirt because he was carrying literature on a dolly. He was running it to everybody as we were stationed on the corners, handing out literature to all the people at the general conference session. Linford's book on the pioneers was the favorite by far. I was, I was standing with a young man who spoke some Russian right in front of the, of the main entrance as people were going in and out and handing out literature. And you know they, they accused us of being shepherd's rods and all that because they like to go there and hand out literature. But we handed out literature. And people. Some of the people went and they read, they read the literature. They went back to their hotels and they read the literature. And some of them came back and asked for more literature. Some of them, especially from Africa, came and said, this is so true. I remember this. I remember what was going on with questions on doctrine. And, and it was a wonderful experience. We would walk out into the streets and we were handing all these Seventh-day Adventists who had come there from all over the world. For you see in the general conference session, there are delegates that come to the general conference session from every single country of the world. They even have a little parade where they all come and they have their, their national flag and they march up in the general conference. It was my first time at a general conference session and I tell you, <clears throat> They have to hire a stadium to hold 60, 70,000 people. That's how many people come. And the delegates are selected from all of the churches and conferences from all over the world. Seed was sown. Now they're coming back coming back to St. Louis in 2025. 
I am now going to share you a personal belief. I don't believe in coincidences. I don't believe that God, through his prophet, worked with our pioneers in order to establish a general conference that would require representation from all over the world to be in one place. We have been told that the latter rain will go out by thousands of voices. In the early rain, when the early rain came, the disciples went forward and they began to preach the gospel in the language of the people that were there. And they all went back to their synagogues and told people and it, it started the Christian church. Thousands were converted in a day. Have we been told thousands are going to be converted in a day? I tell you, they're not the Gentiles. They're going to be Seventh-day Adventists. Because all they have to do is accept the understanding that Jesus is... Amen. Because when they accept the fact that Jesus is the Son of God and they reject the Trinity, they're going to be sitting right here with you and me. I have never given up on the Seventh-day Adventist church. I am a Seventh-day Adventist. They may have given up on me, but that's okay. They gave up on the disciples too, but did the disciples give up on them? No. God is far more forbearing and long-suffering than we are. No, their probation didn't close until they killed one of us. Now, I want to give you some understanding of what the earth was like at the day of Pentecost. When the fullness of time was come, 4,000 years, we're coming up on 6,000 years, God sent forth his son. Now, listen to this. Providence had directed the movement of the nations. We watch all the things that are going on amongst the nations. Providence is doing all of this. The tide of human impulse and influence until the world was ripe for the coming of the deliverer. Is that what's going on now? The nations were united under one government. Is that what we're going to see when the woman rides the beast? I don't know, but they were all under the government of Rome. One language was widely spoken. Is there one language that's widely spoken? Yes. yes. I, I, I know because I'm in, I'm in business, and the language of the world is English because it's the language of commerce, of money. When you go to other places in the world, you, you know that they teach their children English as a primary language? even in third world nations. Everywhere the language was recognized as the language of literature. From all lands, the Jews of the dispersion gathered to Jerusalem for the annual feasts. And as they returned to the places of their sojourn, they could spread throughout the world the tidings of the Messiah's coming. Can you imagine if a group of people were to receive something like the day of Pentecost at a general conference session? Where everyone in the world is there and God gave the gift of, of languages to that group of people and they came out and were able... And, and, and you're talking to me. He, this, guy, this white guy is talking to me in a language that uh, 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 nobody outside my village knows. Who knows? But that's the way it was done then. We are told to ask ye the Lord reign in the time of the latter reign. Not to rest satisfied in the ordinary course of the season. Rain will fall. Ask for it. The disciples became apostles on the day of Pentecost. Right up to the moment that Jesus was crucified, they were arguing amongst themselves who would be the greatest. But on the day of Pentecost, they were all in one place of one accord. Now when I, when I look at 
what's going on in, in this movement, I, I almost shake my head and say, how will we ever be of one accord? For the disciples, it took the cross. Who knows what God will do between now and then? What will happen to us? The kind of trials we're going to go under between now and then as a result of things going on in the world. Because I tell you, brothers and sisters, the disciples, when Jesus was crucified, they were hiding in a room behind locked doors because they were afraid for their life. Review and Herald, March 2nd, 1897. She writes... Where two or three are gathered together in my name, there I am in the midst. Amen. The convocations of the church, as in church camp meetings, assemblies, home church, and other occasions where there is personal labor for souls, are God's appointed opportunities for giving the early and the latter rain. The general conference session is a church convocation. What a great place to go to do personal labor for souls. That's what we did in 2005. Now, I, I want, I'd like to read to you this statement twice. She writes, As the Jews had departed from God, faith had grown dim. And hope had well nigh ceased to illuminate the future. The words of the prophets were uncomprehended. She's talking about when Christ came. The Jews were scattered everywhere, and their expectation of the Messiah's coming was to some extent shared by the Gentiles. Among those whom the, Jew, the Jews styled heathen were men who had a better understanding of the scriptures and prophecies concerning the Messiah than some of the teachers of Israel. Among the Jews, there were yet, though, steadfast souls, descendants from the holy line who through whom a knowledge of God had been preserved. These still looked for the hope of the promise made unto their fathers. They staggered, they strengthened their faith by dwelling upon the assurances giving them, given them through Moses. Now I'd like to reread those paragraphs again. As Seventh-day Adventists had departed from God, faith had grown dim. And hope had well nigh ceased to illuminate the future. The words of the prophet were uncomprehended. The Seventh-day Adventists were everywhere scattered, and their expectations of the Messiah's coming was to some extent shared by the Gentiles. Is that, is that all true? Yeah. It is. Among the Seventh-day Adventists, there were yet steadfast souls, descendants of the Holy Line, through whom a knowledge of God had been preserved. These still looked for the hope of the promise made unto their fathers. We call them the pioneers. They strengthened their faith by dwelling upon the assurances given them by Ellen G. White. We all recognize that tremendous things are going on in the earth. Everybody's talking about it. You don't have to be a Seventh-day Adventist. Everybody's talking about it. It's a great time to witness. We just need the power of God. The great work of the gospel is not to close with less manifestations of the power of God than marked its opening. The prophecies which were fulfilled in the outpouring of the former reign at the beginning of the gospel are again to be fulfilled in the latter reign as its close. Here are the times of refreshing to which the apostle Peter looked forward to when he said, Repent ye therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing come from the presence of the Lord and he shall send Jesus. Servants of God, with their faces lighted up and shining with holy consecration, will hasten from place to place to proclaim the message from heaven. 
by thousands of voices all over the earth, the warning will be given. Brothers and sisters, we don't have thousands of people in our movement. Yet. There was only 120 in that upper room, but when they stepped out, there were thousands. The warning will be given. Miracles will be brought. The sick will be healed. Signs and wonders will follow the believers. Satan also works with lying wonders, even bringing fire down from heaven in the sight of men. Thus the inhabitants of the earth will be brought to take their stand. The message will be carried not so much by, the argu by argument as by the deep conviction of the Spirit of God. The arguments have been presented. The seed has been sown and now it will spring up and bear fruit. I don't believe that we went to the General Conference in 2005 to distribute all that literature in vain. The publications distributed by missionary workers have exerted their influence. Yet many whose minds were impressed have been prevented from fully comprehending the truth or from yielding obedience. Now the rays of light penetrate everywhere. The truth is seen in its clearness and the honest children of God sever the bands which have held them. Family connections don't matter. Church relations don't matter. They are all powerless to stay them now. Truth is more precious than all beside. Amen. Notwithstanding the agencies combined against the truth, a large number take their stand on the Lord's side. Praise God. Brothers and sisters, by God's grace, I'm going back to that general conference in 2025. Amen. And I hope to see Vlad and Linford and Alan, and David, and Neville, and you. And after these things, I saw another angel come down from heaven having great power. And the earth was lighted with his glory. And he cried mightily with a strong voice, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, and has become the habitation of devils. Maybe there's something going to go on at that 2025 general conference that's going to make it the habitation of devils. I don't know. I want to share one more thing with you if I can if I can do this. Maybe not. A number of years ago I was at a camp meeting and the topic of my sermon was I'm a Seventh Day Adventist. And I read a whole series of Spirit of Prophecy quotations in that talk that showed that the name Seventh-day Adventist was a God-given name. Amen. I have no intention of taking another name until God gives me another name. Hopefully that's on my forehead. It's a God-given name. Do you know that she says that that name will be a rebuke to the world during the time of the Mark of the Beast? Now, that hasn't arrived yet. She says, as a matter of fact, we will hold that name until probation closes. And it makes sense because the name Seventh-day Adventist, looking for the soon coming of Jesus, which, we, which, we're, which we're proclaiming, and the fact that we keep all of God's commandments, specifically identifying the seventh day which Satan has used to cause the whole world to wander after the beast, is a rebuke to them. It, it's something that you're... Can, can you imagine that the name Seventh-day Adventist could be used by God as a prick to prick someone's conscience?
When the mark of the beast comes, if you think this through, and the controversy is between those who worship Satan and those who worship God, those who are a Trinitarian or a pagan, it doesn't matter what, what it is, and those who worship the true God, right? I've always believed that Adventists are going to come to a crisis point where they have to choose between the God they worship and the day they worship. And the mark of the beast will do that. Because they're going to either, they're either going to have to give up Trinitarianism in, to, in order to continue to keep the Sabbath worshiping the true God, or they're going to continue to, to be Trinitarians and have to go to Sunday. Because the laws will require it. And they will no longer, those who abandon the truth, the church appears to fall, but it does not fall. God will take his fan in his hand and thoroughly purge his floor. All that's fine. But they won't be able to call themselves Seventh day Adventists. They won't be able to. They'll have to change the name or do something different. When the time comes, Seventh day Adventists will be referred to as those who keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus. Brothers and sisters, I have not given up on my Seventh-day Adventist brethren. I have not given up at all. And I look forward to a Pentecost experience where God brings back to the church with power. See, he didn't raise this movement up in vain, brothers and sisters. He didn't. The Seventh-day Adventist movement that God raised up will fulfill its purpose in the same way the Jews fulfilled their purpose. Did the Jews fulfill their purpose on the day of Pentecost? Yes, thousands were converted in a day. They brought forth the Messiah. They held the oracles of God. We, we, we hold the writings of Ellen G. White, which have been translated in every language of the world. Bible societies have taken the Bible and translated it in every language of the world. We live in a time where the gospel of the kingdom is everywhere in the world in literature, regardless of the state of the church. What was the state of the church like when Jesus came the first time? It wasn't very good. But did they fulfill their purpose? They did. They did. And they became the Christian church. I have high hopes for our brethren, and I hope you do too. God be praised. Amen. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your word. Lord, I recognize I'm no prophet, but I'm thankful for the evidence of the time that we live in that you have given us. Lord, we all want to be tools in your hand, and we pray that you will use us. With the short time remaining, Father, we worship you. We worship you now, like we will throughout all eternity, Father. We worship you. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.